Altem achol v'savra. So this Mimer was said in Tafkuf Samech Zayin, meaning two years before the Alter Rebbe was incarcerated the first time. So it was said in Lojna. And it was said on Parshas Naso. Okay. Meaning that it wasn't said directly in connection with Tzav. There's a whole question, why is this even here? Why is this in Tzav? So in, in, in chapter 2 we'll see why. Because really this is talk, This is based on a medrash on our Parsha. So even though he talked in Parsha's Naso, there's a strong connection to our Parsha. The, 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 the general connection between Naso and Tzav is very very clear. And, and, and Be'yikra, Tzav, all of them. Because Tzav is part of what Hashem said to Moshe Rabbeinu on the first day that he talked to him from the Mishkan, which was the first day of Nisan. And on the, the first day of why, Nisan... The question is, why is Naso in the wrong place? Oh, right. So you could ask it the other way around. Why is Naso so late? Why do we hear about what happened in Naso, which is the korbanos of the Nesim, the, sacri- the offerings brought by the princes of the tribes? Why did that wait for another twelve, par- uh, another eleven parshas afterwards? So we get to it. But the connection is clear. So, but but here he's going to go on, on something more obscure, a more obscure connection that the Medrash brings. Okay, so let's see. It says in the book of Joel, Yoel, chapter two. I don't know where. Verse twenty-six. Where's Yoel? Yoel is in Treasar, yeah, in the know. eleven mine, uh, in the twelve minor prophets. What happened to my uh, tape recording of the uh, Tanakh? Tanakh, it's coming. Then I'll be able to listen to Yoel. Right. Very short book. It's three chapters, I think, two or three. And it says in, the, in there, there's a verse that says, You shall eat and be satisfied. And you shall eat and be satisfied. <laughs> you shall eat and eat and be satisfied. But the second eat is not eat and eat. No, v'achaltem v'achaltem. It's v'achaltem achol v'savua. Achol is the passive tense. It's not food, it's not a... No. That is, we say, achaltem ochel v'savatem, something like that. But here it's v'achaltem achol v'savoa. And the savoa is it should be satiated. And again, it's in the passive tense. It's not in the, it's not in the uh, active sense. V'ilaltem et shem Hashem elokechem. You shall praise God, the name of God, Hashem your God. Asher asayim achem lafnu, has done with you wonders. V'lo yevoshu amil olam. You shall never be, how would you say, yevoshu. Uh, never be disgraced. Disgraced again. When did you live? Yo. Good question. First time or second? No, first time. All, all, all in the first time. The question is on, after which prophet? I don't have a good answer for you. Okay. Uviyakucham. I do have a good answer for you if you give me a minute. Yeah. Have a minute? I'll we'll do it later. Uviyakucham. And then Yakuchimoni, which is a collection of many Midrashim from different places. It's a very, very early collection, something in the, I think, 7th century, 8th century. When he blesses the righteous, he doubles their blessings. It says, You shall both eat, and you shall not be disgraced. So it's two things, because usually when a person is eating, he's disgraced. He's disgraced. In the end, he's disgraced. Why? Because there's never such a thing as eating properly. Almost never. So much so, that the halacha is, that the moment a person becomes a parnas of the tzibur, meaning that he's, uh, he's a minister in the government, whatever he is, whatever public uh, the duty is filling, he's not allowed to eat in front of people. The ribbon of it. Okay. You don't eat in front of people. Why? Because it's always a disgrace. Uh, the few times that uh, um, somehow, I don't know, we uh, was teaching right after I ate. There's a pieces stuck in my mouth and so people saw that I was like <laughs> and people wrote to me on the Facebook on YouTube it's, it's disgraceful that yeah. somebody who's teaching should be uh, picking, his teeth. picking his teeth or, or, or almost so eating it's interesting that I've never seen Rav Yitzchuk, um ever refrain from eating when he's on camera never he doesn't do it when he's talking but 
He he does. He eats like when it's like a bar mitzvah or a, whatever a bris. He, and and the video's on and, the, and he's being recorded. He eats. He's never he's never seen him uh, refrain from it. Perhaps he eats very small pieces and doesn't open his mouth much. He doesn't open his mouth. It's not that disgraceful, but I don't know. So we're going to be talking about eating, but the point here is not going to be so much eating. The point here is going to be that even though we do a lot of work in this life and in this world, the work is, is not finished the first time. It's almost like you have to, like, you have to ruminate. <laughs> it's almost like you eat, and then it's eaten again. So all the work that we do is called Achila. Well, let's see how. Hinein yan kavanat Achila, the intent behind eating is, Ki yesh neshamot u malachim vibchinat ishtashlut alamot biya, nifrodi brati vitzarti, vesh malachim de briya, vesh malachim de yitzira, vesh malachim de asiya. So, first of all, I have to know that there are souls and angels. We know they have different sources. The souls have a different source in God than the angels. And there are different, just as there are different souls from different levels of consciousness, from creation, formation, and action, the same thing applies to angels. There are angels of creation, angels of formation, angels of action. They too have to eat. The angels eat something. Obviously they don't eat what we eat. So they too need to eat, and their food is what they get by contemplating God. They, they receive sustenance by contemplating godliness. That's how they... That's how they... Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's exactly the idea behind it. That there he was acting like an angel. He was getting sustenance from his observance, his, his contemplation of the Almighty. And that's what it means when it says, when Hashem is telling Moshe Rabbeinu, be careful of the angel that I'm going to send with you, because my name is inside him. What do you mean, my name is inside him? So people think about this. They, they say uh, maybe he's got, you know, he's like a, he's like a vessel, and somehow his name. Okay, what does it mean? So they really eat God's name, as it were. But to eat it means that they contemplate it. They, it enters their consciousness. It enters their mind. Whatever the, the, the type of mind that they have. And in the end, their sustenance becomes our food. Meaning, what they went through digesting, as it were, the first time, what the angels went through digesting the first time, becomes the food that we eat here. Okay. So for instance, if you are eating something that's completely synthetic, I don't know what that would be like. It would be entirely synthetic, not made in, at all out of produce. It's not something that's grown. Is, is there such a food? Yeah, there's this new meat now. That's no, that's from, that's from meat. You take cells from, a, from, a, from an animal. Oh, yeah. I know, but the more processed something is, the less it's connected to the world of the angels. That's how you would say. So every blade of grass, every single type of plant that grows, has some kind of angel that strikes it. That's the language Bro. of the And it says that it grows. So what do we mean? We mean that this is some kind of, 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 uh, of, of law of nature that causes things to grow. And the beautiful thing about it is that it happens by itself. You don't have to do anything. I mean, it needs water, but you know, many places in the world people don't water, like the Amazon or whoever else, 
and the nature waters it. So it's all happening, it's all part of the ecological system that they're living in, and you could say, in, in a very real sense, that angels are like the laws of nature, at least the way they're manifest for us. So, there are different types of angels, like we said, but there are angels that, what they are, is just what we call laws of nature. Because the mazal, the sign, as we call it, or the conduit, the spiritual conduit, is a spiritual force. So the angels are like passing it down. It's almost like saying, uh, in a cow, there's four different stomachs. So each stomach passes it down to the next one. It's also the same thing in a person. You have different parts to your in the digestive system, and each part is like taking the food to an, to another level, right? Uh, esophagus just the, uh, or the, the teeth can crunch it down, and the esophagus takes it into the stomach, and the stomach digests it, but then it goes through a lot more. The pancreas adds this, and the, and the, and the liver adds that, and it goes into the intestines, and then the, uh, the intestines are what they do to it, and then it gets to the large intestine, and the, and, and the liver gives more stuff, and then and the, and the, and the, and the more, uh, until you get it out. But all the way, it's a process, it's a tag team process. The same thing happens with the angels. For there to be physical things in our world, there's a process of, like we would say today, that the angels at the level of creation are maybe the laws of physics. The angels at the level of formation are the laws of chemistry. And the angels at the level of action are the laws of biology. Let's say there's some kind of biological law that you come, you come across. It. Photosynthesis, for instance, would be a type of biological law. It's not something that's entirely just chemical. There's something more happening there. And that's what's going on. Or like now, using uh, trying to uh, 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 genetically modify uh, produce. So it's also you're playing with the laws of biology or something. So there's, there's a cascade of events that happen until you get to the physical food in our world. What's the first thing that happens? In creation, the angels are contemplating God's name. That's, that's what he's saying. That's, that's their sustenance. That's what they're taking. They're taking God's names, you would say the pure divine energy, and they're bringing it down into something lower and something lower and so on. Again, I think the best muscle to understand this is in the same way that we would say that, uh, that biology builds on chemistry, which builds on physics. And this is all how things are created in the world. What happened to your mathematics? That's in the world of emanation. He didn't talk about this. You could say, if you continue, so you would say that, that physics in the end builds on numbers. So numbers are like the names of God, and we see that it's that way. Because Sefer Yetzirah begins, there are 22 letters and 10 Sfirot. The 10 Sfirot literally means the 10 Sfirot, but it also means the 10 numbers because Sapir and Mispam are related, right? So, so the numbers would be a lower level of the Sfirot. You could number them from 1 to 10. So why is it names of God? Because, because of the 22 letters. They're at the same level. The 22 letters and the 10 Sfirot. They're called Lamed Bet Netivot Chochma. The 32 channels of wisdom. And they're all, wisdom is always in the world of emanation. So, from these angels, you get in the end the angels in the chariot, of which there are three types, uh, sorry, there's three types and then there's the face of man also there, right? So from the type that's like the ox, you get all the produce that is animals. So you get the cows and the chickens and so on. No, not the chickens, sorry. the cows and the goats and the... Okay. And from the eagle in the chariot, you get all the... Uh, uh, birds. And finally, when spiritual food 
is added above, meaning they have a new contemplation. So again, where do they get their contemplations from? That's the big question. Where do they get these new contemplations from, the angels? From us. Okay. When we learn something new, that's what really inspires them. So the Rambam says that they contemplate Hashem better than we do. Meaning they have a clearer picture of how this is related to godliness. But the ideas come from here. As far as I understand, the ideas come from here. And this is a big theme in Hasidus, that every time that a tzaddik thinks up a new way of understanding something in Torah, everybody, in the, it causes a big ruckus in Shemai. Okay? It causes a big, uh, a big storm. Why? Because, wow, this is a new way to create produce for the world. This is a new source of sustenance. So for what's es- es- I don't know if that's a new way of, of thinking about Torah, but every time the Rebbe said a chiddush, But that every time that somebody has a new insight in Torah that causes something new to be created in the heavens and that cascades down into new forms of produce. Things that we haven't seen yet. The whole point of this cascade is that when man, whose source, the source of the souls we also said, comes from the world of creation, it's from what we call the world of the chair, of the throne, and all the, th- all the souls are taken from the world of the throne, which is the world of creation. That when man, whose source is also from the world of creation, eats from this produce, and they, man, the souls, are more inner, they come from a more essential aspect of godliness than the angels do. Even though the angels can contemplate more easily, because they don't have a monkey inside their brain, okay, jumping around all the time, causing them to lose focus. They don't have a Sahara. That's the monkey. That's the monkey, the copy. <laughs> a copy of the man who's not really a man. So even though they are even though the angels can contemplate more clearly, the source of the ideas is mankind. Because the souls are more inner than the angels. And when man eats the produce it adds strength of ability to contemplate in him. Meaning he's able to be mechadish, he's able to, to, to say something new in, in his Torah learning. And the produce is actually giving him sustenance from a higher place. This we talked about many times in Torah Or. That the source of the produce that we eat, whatever is growing in the animals and so on, is from a higher place than the souls. Because it's from the the, the the world of the of the of the kings of Edom that shattered before our world of rectification was created. So man is the fourth face in the chariot. And so when we contemplate, we go in the opposite direction from the angels. Again, that the angels bring it down, and we bring it back up. So whatever we ate from what they created, what they cascaded down, what they digested on the way down, we bring back up. So now, what do we have here? We have a whole system, a whole elevator going up and down. And the going down is the angels. They're considered, like we just said, they're the faces of the animals in the chariot. The ox and the eagle, also the lion. 
The human is the face of the human in the chariot. So who's higher than whom? So we see that the animals serve man, meaning the angels in this sense, they're serving us. So if you see it happening once, you can imagine that it's not going to be that way forever because there's always elevations. So once we finish 6,000 years, as it's called, once we finish this reality, there will be a new reality. And in that reality, what do you expect? That's what he says. Just as the angels now are like animals relative to the souls, so the souls that we have now, relative to the souls that will be revealed in the future, are like animals. And that's what it means in the Raya Mehemna when he talks about there being souls that are like animals. He's talking about our souls. But what about the people who don't have any connection to Yiddish? Ad, 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 at, what are they living on? And they're not serving the full purpose, but they will eventually. But they are, they are receiving food. They are receiving sustenance. So okay, but they're not them? bringing them back up because they're not using so, it for so Torah. So where are they receiving coming from? What do you mean? The, the cascade down is always working. It's like a waterfall. The waterfall is always working. Whether you're going to lift the water back up to its source or not, that's, that's a different question. And you're saying, where, where does the, how does the water get back up the waterfall? Oh, it's a long process if you don't do it by yourself. It has to go into the ocean, then it has to go evaporate, and then it has to become clouds, and it has to go in the rain, and then the waterfall is filled again. It takes, I don't know, six, seven months. But if you do it yourself, it's much quicker. And it's, it'll still, water will still come down, the angels will still do what they do. But the point here is that since there's always elevation in the world, this is the thing, this is the thing that changes everything. The picture of, before you learn Chassidus, before you learn Zohar, the picture of the world is that the world is broken and let's bring it back to what it was like. The citizens are not, is not interested in that. <laughs> you don't bring it back to where it was. You brought it back to where it was. What did you gain? There's nothing to be gained by that. You want to elevate it. Yeah, you go higher. And every time that there is a cycle, you aim to go higher. You never go to the same level. What was the point? Right? In Chabad, there's a nigun called Tzama Lechon Nafshi. But not the Tzama, the long one. The short one with the Ukrainian words in it. What do the Ukrainian words say? So the Rebbe, when he taught the Nigun, he said, there's a guy, Marco. Marco is like saying, hey guy, what are you doing in the market? You're not buying, you're not selling, you're just making a big, big, big mess. So he said, like, there's a guy is standing in the marketplace, and he yells, I have to sell, I have to sell. And everybody comes running, what do you have to sell? Nothing. Nothing. And then he says, I want to buy, I want to buy. No, where's your money? No money. So says, that's like a person who came into this world and he doesn't realize that the world is a place where you're supposed to make a profit. It's almost all, a lot of people understand that they want to make a profit. That's a good thing about capitalism. Capitalism at least taught people that you're supposed to make a profit. Communism is anti-Torah, completely the, the, the worst thing you can possibly imagine. Because you teach people that they should only get enough to sustain themselves. They should get equally, or I don't know what. Oh, it's worse because it says that everybody's equal, so therefore there's no coin in your view. No, no. There's no hierarchy, there's nothing. Which is a big lie, because in the end, of course, there's hierarchy. And the guys in the Politburo, they're the guys who run everything, and they have everything. And that's how China works, and that's why we know that it's terrible. It's it's a it's, it's not much of profanity. It's, there's no there's another way of saying it, and it's cheating people out of their God-given right to make a profit in the world. Now the whole problem is, the capitalism is not so great either because it teaches you that the profit is some kind of physical profit, and it doesn't teach you enough that the physical profit, if at all, 
if you need it at all, is only to sustain a spiritual profit. And that's what you really, your soul really came into the world for. The world doesn't know anything about Ruchnis. It does. It's not to say that it doesn't at all. You know, people live in New York, so they say we want to be cultured. And so it sort of lo- works like the men make the money. I don't know if it's that way anymore, but the classic picture in the 80s when I grew up was the men are the brokers and the lawyers and this and that. And the women host parties. And the more money you have, the grander the parties. What do you do at the parties? So obviously there was also obscenity and other things, but, but there was also there was also parties that were for obscene things. But the real dinner parties were for culture. They were for something, and then you, and you have an art collection, and you share it, and this and that. There was some spiritual profit. It wasn't, it wasn't anything at all. Then came the Rebbe, and at least for the Jews, he was able to turn it around to a great deal. And so suddenly, having money became um, a good tool for advancing spirituality, for making another school, for making another shul, for making... It became something that, that, had, that had more meaning than just... Again, the point is, how do you get people to understand that the money is not going to serve them forever? How do you get them to understand that they want to make a real profit? And the real profit is, how much spirituality can you take away with you into the world to come? That's a real issue. But, but you have to be in the attitude that there's a profit to be made. <laughs> you have to be thinking along those terms. So obviously it's, it's very easy to do it to capitalists. It's a little harder to do it with people who, who don't uh, have uh, in their minds you know, moving ahead. But in that sense, America is great because everybody's a capitalist. Everybody wants to make a buck. Everybody wants... So it shouldn't what be so hard. To, what happened to Africa and Asia where the people... Right, they're stuck. Uh, no, they're they're just, there's nothing. There's no, no they're stuck. Nothing. Yeah, they're stuck. Because Yiddishkeit didn't, didn't get, come there. The thing that the Goyim always blamed the Jews for was that that all they wanted to do was make a profit. (laughs) In a certain sense, they were right. The problem was there were certain Jews that understood the profit meant how much money I had. But the real real leaders always knew that if there's any profit physically to be made, it's only to serve the spiritual profit. So if I made $100 million, I don't need more than $100,000 a year so the rest of it can go to tzedakah to make sure that other people can make a spiritual profit. And that's the real profit. But it's very hard to work with somebody who doesn't even understand that the soul came into the world to profit from something. So you can also profit from good deeds. You don't have to necessarily sin and learn. You can do many things. But you have to have that attitude. So if everything is going up, everything is being elevated, so you have to begin to understand that even your life, what you've done in your life, is only a, call it, a, uh, it's only material for creating something higher. Even everything you've done in your life is going to be used to reach an even higher level. In the same way that whatever the angels did, as they cascaded the produce down into our world, is used by us to to elevate it. So the same thing is going to happen with the souls. When we mean by souls, when people hear this in the beginning, they say, oh, my soul's destined to be eaten. It's destined to be used by somebody else. That's not the meaning. Because the soul is every single day. When did he give it to you? We wake up in the morning. We say, the soul that you gave me. When did he give it to me? It's not the soul that I had when I uh, was born. Maybe every single hour I get a new soul. Every single minute I can get a new soul. Soul means whatever inspires me now. Mm-hmm. And that can change from day to day. And specifically when you learn... What you get in return is that the soul comes down renewed. And like renewed, what we mean is it's new. It's not just renewed in the sense of refurbished. Same soul, just we fixed some things. You get a new one. But souls are not like, like physical entities. So that when you 
bring a new soul down, it doesn't have to necessarily replace the old one. The old one can still be there, and the, and the new one is there also. So we call it renewed, rejuvenate. But every day, in that sense, what I did yesterday has to become food for what I do today. It has to be something that I build on in order to do what I do today. Now, <clears throat> in produce, this was very clear. Like if you were a farmer, so you understood that what you ate yesterday was for you to go into the field today in order to grow something new. It was very clear. It's a cycle that works in every time. The problem was... That we talked about. This is what grows by itself is even higher. But it's only once every seven years. So the idea here is that you can't treat what you do today as the end of the line. What you do today has to be something that you build on for what you do tomorrow. Spiritually as much as physically. Now, most of the world is like that today. Like engineering is that way. What you built today is what you're going to use tomorrow to do something better. But if you're just a, if you're just a, I don't know, if you're, if you're just pushing paper, you don't have that experience. It's very, you, you, it's very hard to, you have to keep bettering what you're doing because what you did today should be a basis for what you do now. So for instance, somebody who's writing, so they know this, that what you wrote today is the basis for what you're going to edit tomorrow. And when you've edited it once, it doesn't mean that that's the end of the line. You can do something more with it. And you keep regurgitating, as it were, but every time it gets better, it becomes something of a bigger project. The, the best example today is, is, I think, is what Elon Musk is doing. His dream was always to get to Mars. I think from the time he was uh, 15 years old. So he broke apart, it's like how an engineer works. He broke apart the problem. And he, and he, and he asked, I don't think he knew all the answers right away. It took him time to figure out what the answers were. But how do you set up permanent human life on Mars? What do you need to do? I don't know the answer to everything. But I can guess from what he's doing, some of the answers. So one of the, I think about this a lot because it's a very interesting engineering problem. So one of the, one of the uh, conclusions that I'm sure you came to was you won't be able to have humans set up the permanent human uh, presence. You're going to need machines to do it. So how is NASA approaching this? NASA was thinking, well, we're good at robots, so we'll build some robots that will do something. Or we'll send short missions that will... They said, this is going to take a million years. If you send astronauts for four years, let's say you even find four dedicated people that are willing to go there for their entire, the rest of their lives. And let's say that they're willing to sign off and I won't be brought back. This is what I want to do in my life. So how much can four people do? They can't do heavy lifting. If you send a lot of, there's not much they'll be able to do. And it'll take hundreds of years for this to happen. I mean, because the first set of astronauts will figure out how to, I don't know, cultivate, you know, I don't know, five meters, uh, no, five square kilometers, let's say. As much as they'll do, they won't do much. You've got millions of square kilometers of, of, of Mars to, to, to work on. So his answer was, I need robots to do this. Robots can work. They can make robots. They can use the, the, the materials they find to make new ones, actually. And, and they can build, and they can multiply and you can send more of them. They don't need to sign off that that's what they do for the rest of their lives. But the problem is that if you send one of these funny little, you know, things that walks around and, uh, and measures uh, the sand, and uh, you get one of these every five years, NASA is going to finish this project in, 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 in 50,000 years. They're never going to finish it. So he says, what's the problem? The problem is that they don't know how to mass produce machines and make machines. They don't know how to do this. So the real problem I have to solve is how do I make machines that make machines? That's the real question. Now you can't just make a machine that makes machine. You need a lot of experience with it. It takes time. So he asked a different question. He said, what's the thing that I could learn about how to make machines that make machines and I would be funded by people on Earth? I can't tell them I'm going to Mars. It's, nobody, it's a pipe dream. Nobody cares. I know what I'll tell them. 
what's the next what's the next step in 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 stuff we know we don't have to i don't want to invent the uh, I, I, it's engineering it's not inventions he said an electric electric car that's the thing that everybody is going to want when he started out I don't know, 10 years ago he said this is going to happen why because we got a climate crisis we have this we have that oil's out it's gonna it's gonna finish it's it's a dangerous call because for a long time people didn't think he was right and Tesla stock was very low and then people suddenly the, the, it clicked that yes the world's going electric and the moment that went like the electric he became the second richest person in the world because he's working on a problem that's easily solvable relatively speaking but he's not really working on that problem he doesn't care about the electric vehicles what he cares about is that his factory is going to be 100% machines. Because he wants to learn about how machines make machines. That's what he's interested in. And if he can solve that problem, he can ship these guys off to Mars, and they'll build their own factory, and they'll build everything that's needed to create a habitat for human beings. But to ship them off to Mars, you need to, to, to have a, 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 a... So in the beginning, I think it was very happy to let... NASA build, but he saw NASA as the same problem with going to space. They have the same problem as they do with building machines. They don't know how to do it because they're trying to solve problems that don't exist. So he solved the problem in the easiest way he could. And so he built SpaceX. And, and that's, and within three, four, five years, he's going to have a, a factory on Mars producing what's needed. So that's pulling yourself up each time. You're using what you knew in order to make something new. That's the true capitalist spirit. Because I'm always making a profit, but, but if I'm using money, if I have money, I use money to make money. I, I never stop. So all the more so when it comes to spirituality. If you've learned X, so the Rebbe says, teach X. You learned Aleph, teach Aleph. Why? Because Aleph now is the basis for an act of chesed. Because if you know something, do something with it. Don't, don't, don't let it lie. So every time, that's called souls begetting souls. That's what he means here. This, this is one of, the, one of the sources for this whole idea that the moment you accept that elevation is constant, going higher is constant, then everything has to be a seed for something higher. You can't leave it the way it is. You just can't. And if you leave it, you missed it. And it has to be every day, every day. Whatever I had yesterday is the base of it. So for instance, Kriyashma. Kriyashma, when you go to sleep. Traditionally, Kriyashma was a time for recollecting and making a reckoning of what I did. The Rebbe changed it. He said, you're right. There has to be some element of recollection, but it's not in order to make a reckoning about how things were wrong. It's to make a reckoning for what I'm going to do better yet tomorrow. With what I did. That's what it means that the, in the, in the place that the Baal Tshuva stands, uh, a perfect tzaddik can't. Why? Because the, because the Baal Tshuva has more material to work with. What's his material? Even what he did wrong. Even if I did something wrong, it's like Edison, the famous story. On the contrary, it's not that I've failed 3,000 times to find the filament for an incandescent light bulb. I said, I know that 3,000 materials don't work. So I'm closer. There must be something that works. In the same way, if you, if you do something wrong, you said, oh, that becomes food for tomorrow, for how I'm going to do things right tomorrow. And, and, and everything in the world works that way today. Everything in the world, every single organization that, that cares about itself looks at what it did at the end of the day, the end of the week, the end of the month, whatever it is, the end of the project, and says, how do we do it better next time? And that means that that, that basic principle in, 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 Torah, uh, in the Torah outlook on life has reached everywhere, basically, except for people who don't do it, and, or maybe we don't do it enough. So what I did yesterday is like an animal's it's like an animal compared to what I'm going to do as a human. So yesterday, yes, I was an animal. It's like saying, it's also how the Tanya is built. The Tanya says that the Benoni, 
has an animal soul and a divine soul. The animal soul is always the past. That's how you need to look at it. In the past, I was an animal. <laughs> I acted like an animal. I thought like an animal. My thoughts were low. There was, there was, not, not to d d disgrace myself. But to understand what I'm capable of much more. The future is my divine soul. I'm here stuck in the present, and I have to decide, what am I going to do? Am I going to be bogged down by my past and remain a brute? Or am I going to move forward and become divine? That's the whole question. Where, where am I going to look? To the past or to the future? Uh, that's all. You can look to the future and still be a brute. Because you're looking at the future and saying, yesterday I was a brute, today I'll be, tomorrow I'll be a brute also. So he's not going anywhere. So he's Marco. He's the guy in the, in the, he came down into the marketplace and he's got nothing to buy, nothing to sell. And uh, his life is meaningless. So th that's what he's going to talk about in this Mimer. And he's going to connect it, connect it hopefully tomorrow, right? When we have five more minutes. We have five more minutes, so this is going to be going. So even souls will have to elevate when the new souls come about. And again, I said, when you read it in the Zohar, when you read it in the Rizal, it sounds like some other era. But the greatness of Chassidus is that you take this and you say, it's not just some other era that will come upon us. Every day is a new era. And every day I have a new soul compared to yesterday. The al day. And what will happen? That the souls of the past, they become the Leviathan and the wild ox that the Medrashim talk about, which are like the Suda of Mashiach. And the righteous will eat them. What do you mean the righteous? My soul tomorrow, my divine soul of tomorrow will eat the past. And they'll, and they'll elevate the past to a higher state. In the same way that we physically consume the produce from the angels, which are likened to animals, now in the present. So what is he saying? He's saying that all these, all these midrashim about Livyasam and Shorabar and oh, are now... Literally. Right now, they're right now. You can have the Suudas to Justin every day if you want. So, Rebbe Mashiach is here now. Okay. The, the whole, it was the same thing by the Baal Shem Tov. It's just a question when is it going to click? When are we finally going to get it? When we finally get it, we'll understand that every single day you can have a Suudas to Justin. Suudas to Justin means that today, like King David, who makes the Kiddush there. Yeah. Where is Yitzchak? No, King David. So, oh, Yitzchak So, because he's the one who ate it. Yeah. So you have to understand, that, again, people are waiting for some Seuda, really. <laughs> the Seuda is what you did yesterday. It's made out of everything that you did yesterday. Nachon, there's also, it's true, that there's also a general Seuda where everybody will partake at the same time. That'll be the switch. The general switch. But in a certain sense, that switch was already done. I wouldn't be surprised that we'll look back at some point and say that one of the Fabrengans of the Rebbe was the Suda Sivrasan. For him, every day was the Suda Sivrasan. There's no question. Because every day he took what was in the past and he ate it as a Suda and he made from it tomorrow. Okay, so all this, where did it start? All this started in the korbanos, in the sacrifice. Again, it's a state of mind. It's not getting to Mars or not getting to Mars. That's not interesting. That's not the point. The question is whether you can live your life in such a way that every day is building upon yesterday. Every day is building upon yesterday. Is it going to be better for my body? I don't know. Maybe it's not so much better. But my outlook has to be that tomorrow I will be able to use what I've learned, what I've done, what I've created until now in a better way than I did today. Tomorrow is better than today. But the moment that that switches in a person's mind, 
he's now in charge of this process, he's, he's become part of this process of every day being a new soul. And, that, and when, you, when you talk about the Alter Rabbi being a new soul, that's what you mean. He took everything that was until him, and he elevated it to a new level. That, that's, what, that's what a new soul does. Whatever I've been given, tomorrow will serve something higher. That's the frame of mind. Okay, so we'll continue tomorrow. Bezrat Hashem.